Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. Welcome back to the show, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome Wendy Patterson from the Bayerstein Institute, based here in Germany, where I'm also located. A warm welcome, Wendy. I'm glad you're here with us. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Hi, Joe. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. And to get our conversation started, how about you share a little bit about your background and then also um, the your current um, position, what you're doing at the Bajan Institute, and of course, a little overview of the Bajan Institute's um, in charge of in servicing the scholarly community. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So my name is Wendy Patterson. And um, yeah, I actually come with a, a research background. So um, I did my PhD in in physics, um, specifically in optics, but then I went through different uh, um, research phases where I worked in material science, eventually in chemistry, um, and worked very multidisciplinary. Um, and um, I did some postdocs as well in different areas of chemistry and material science. And um, but basically um, frustrated with the uh, with with the system, let's just say, um, mm -hmm. I decided that I wanted to do something to better the system um, um, instead of uh, just complaining about it all the time. Um, so well, just eventually I saw an ad for the Baustein Institute. Oh, <laughs> nice. yeah. um, just to clarify, for when we talk about the system, you mean academia at large or anything particularly in it? Yeah, generally academia. And um, for one, the the pressure to, to publish any and everything. Um, this was very frustrating for me as a young scientist, uh, coming naively into the field, thinking that it's about, um, you know, working for the better good and working for um, to to better the world, you know, and to do um, and, and just to um, exercise my my desire to to do science and to mm -hmm. think creatively. And um, I felt that this was not able to happen in the current system. Uh, oh, creativity okay. is not really what what is what is wanted, um, this is, um, you know, what you need to be able to do is um, to get grants and to publish in, in, in specific journals. And this was unfortunately not, uh, this isn't what they tell you um, as an undergraduate, you know, you learn this along the way. And um, yeah, this, this kind of system um, can be frustrating. Um, yeah. And um, if you don't fit into this mold of um, also the kind of stereotypical um, a type personality that um, you know. Then, then sometimes um, you get pushed out of the system, and yeah, it can be frustrating. So because um, incentives and opportunities to advance the career, and but isn't it that an, or or most of not all research institutions also have a mandate and a purpose to fulfill, as often self described. Um, to serve society, to accumulate knowledge, to allow the employed researchers and students to contribute to knowledge acquisition for for the eventual purpose. So I'm I'm wondering where is the crack as we blame the system <laughs> being part of it. <laughs> and like I I just want to to um support your sentiment because it's also what I've experienced myself in, in academia, especially as a PhD student, but also what I see and observe and hear from PhD students that I give workshops to and also senior level researchers that in the first year they're still very much excited they want to cure diseases they want to save the world second well mostly third and fourth year towards the end of the phd they're all exhausted they're pressed for time they're insecure and ashamed oh i don't have enough results to show and then the publication pressure in the neck um so why did it go wrong? 
back because it's it sounds as if everyone's trying to achieve the same thing but yeah it's not for you to answer i'm just putting it out there yeah yeah i mean there's the pressure to publish which which feeds mm -hmm. into pressure to um get big grants which feeds into the um, pressure for departments to perform, you know, at the university, which feeds into universities having to perform to get onto these university rankings because they want the students and they need to keep their enrollment up. So I think these are some of the reasons and some of the triggers that 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 lead to this or that could be leading to this. Um, but I think it's fair to say that that's um, contributing to the dilemma because rankings are also known to be not unfair or to not be reasonable in the first place. You can't compare one university to the other because they have whole different scopes, regional specificities, or not. So it's just not fair to compare. Um, and yet the, there's a need for some assessment for the students right. and also those who set up assessments. Right. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody or none of the people in my network, uh, we don't talk about eliminating metrics or assessment. It's just about... Um, um, uh, thinking about which ones are um, maybe more useful and, and um, also not putting so much pressure on particular one particular metric or um, one particular list of um, or ranking. Um, but but um, yeah, in the end, uh, nothing replaces reading an article or looking at the broad portfolio of a university as a whole. Mm -hmm. I mean, this work has to be done. Um, sure. And trying to simplify it with with lists and rankings, I think this is kind of what's led us, or it's contributed to the situation that um, we know exists. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for for that, yeah for that um, sidetrack. But back to your career. So now, in trying to find a place to change the system to the better and course correct, how does the Western Institute allow you to do that? Yeah, so I was kind of looking for a home somewhere where I felt, um, you know, more more comfortable that my uh, where where my vision of how I want to live my life um, um, fits better with 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 my work. And um, yeah, so I started looking into, let's say, alternatives to the typical academia, typical career in academia. Um, and um, yeah, one path I found was um, or that was suggested to me was to look into journals um but of course coming from from my bad experience or not so great experience with journals um you know mm -hmm. i had only known up to that point kind of commercial i knew some society journals but um i didn't think that that would be a an option for me but then i stumbled across the bashdan institute um and at the time there was um, some open positions for on their editorial team um for um the um for the bashdan journals so that's how i came to the Bastion Institute. Mm -hmm. um, since then, I have, um, I'm, so I began working with the journals and now I'm the uh, scientific director of the Bastion Institute. Um, and um, yeah, so today we are a true charitable foundation. So we receive no external funding whatsoever and we're self-sustained and we only give back to the community. So we don't charge any fees for any of the projects mm -hmm. that we um that that we um, support and um, we do all of this through our long-term sustainable projects that we 100 financially support and like i said we try to remove all the financial barriers um, as much as we can um, into participating into all of our projects and um, we also believe that our mission can be best accomplished by supporting open science principles and mm -hmm. these are weaved into all of our different projects um, and yeah, I can tell you about some of our projects or how we do this, um, if, if that's of interest, but that's, of that's our philosophy, first of all, uh, behind the mm -hmm. Bastion Institute. So, um, so the Bastion Institute exists since, um, as I said on your website, 1951, that's quite a track record, mm -hmm. um, established by the Max Planck Society, which is an association of research institutes or society of research institutes, I think 80 plus. Some are in other countries, Italy, China, I think one or two others, um, most in Germany. Um, so is there still affiliation with the Max Planck Society or is it um, fairly independent? 
No, this was um, this was the founding um, mm. of of our institute, and since then we have had we've gone through various phases of um, mm. maintaining um, our our foundation or maintaining our our institute. Um, we've had different phases in the past where it was um, different business forms, um, mm-hmm. and at some point we had enough um, um, assets that we could actually convert ourselves into a true of uh, a charitable foundation. Um, and this was important to be able to protect um, the work that we do um, to make sure um, that it, it, you know, the kind of work that we do or this um, resources that we have are not um, used um, commercially, but they are for the better good of um, the public. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was an important step was to be able to have enough assets to um, found a a charitable foundation Mm -hmm. um, so that we can work the way we do now, which is, um, yeah, reducing barriers. I'm just, I was just curious to hear the, um, the uh, coming from a Max Planck, where did my pitch team myself? So it's like one big family eventually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so talking about open science, um, thinking about how the UNESCO um, open science recommendation defines it for a globally inclusive um, community encompassing infrastructure. Um, communication as in open science, open data, and so on and so forth. But also, okay, there's these four categories, um, infrastructure, um, open communication, stakeholder engagement, and then also engaging other knowledge systems, primarily um, indigenous knowledge, but also traditional knowledge. Um, but then from how I grew up with open science principles, it's it's more looking towards open access, open data. Um, I think we both agree that it's more important and uh, more important than openness, fairness in data, like findable accessibility and reusability. Yep. Um, because unless fair is given the point of opening or making the data openly accessible just makes sense because then it's not reusable and what's the point in sharing? Mm-hmm. Um, you so can some... make the buffet free, but if you don't give someone the, the fork and knife to eat at the buffet, then um, yeah, it's, they're it's a hot mess. not going to be sustained. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so yeah, I mean, as nice as it sounds, it's also challenging for researchers to think about opening their um but yeah their the lab notebooks and and other um office stores or whatever to the public but um so what are the aspects of open science that the Bachelor institutes um facilitates mm-hmm. yeah so we've actually started several decades ago on our mission to support open science um yeah let's start with open standards um so we've been working with the community for almost two decades on standards for glycomics and enzymology. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have two standards, um, Strenda and Mirage. Um, They are almost two decades old. And um, this is something that we facilitate and we financially support. And um, the stakeholders are all from different parts of the community. Um, And these are very important um, um, in developing guidelines that we continuously with them keep updated and um, also developing tools. So that's also one way we support open data, for example, is the corresponding database um, for mm-hmm. Strenda, which is Strenda DB. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's one way we support open data, mm-hmm. but we, um, we are also supporting open data in our journals, which I'll, I'll also talk a little bit about maybe mm-hmm. as a separate point. Um, and yeah, and in most recent developments, uh, we're also looking to support um, open source software and community led open infrastructure is a new mm-hmm. area that we're looking to support um, and specifically open digital infrastructure for chemistry. So mm-hmm. we're working with the, um, if the word won't mean anything to you if you're not in the chemistry, but the INCHI project, it's an open digital standard uh-huh. um, to digitize uh, chemical structures, which are very, very important for, for chemists. You know, mm-hmm. they read structures, not words. Um, and we need these machine readable. And that's what we're working on with the INCHI project. 
Oh, We're also working with IUPAC on different projects to get um, very important data sets uh, digitized mm -hmm. and also just working on very basic. So the, the, the plumbing, the infrastructure behind um, the exchange of information behind the scenes. So there's a lot of things that that need to happen behind the scenes and this needs maintenance, um, mm -hmm. just like plum plumbing does. Mm -hmm. um, and so plenty of people use roads and plumbing, but you have to maintain it. Right. And that's also what we're looking to do is work on these things that happen kind of behind the scenes that is sometimes difficult to get funding for mm -hmm. um, because no one feels really responsible for it. Um, but these are the kind of projects that we are also looking to fund as open infrastructure. You also mentioned communication. Um, so we support the direct communication of research results with, um, we host symposia mm -hmm. um, in all areas of the chemical sciences and beyond. And we've been doing this since um, I think 1988 was the first one, but um, a long time. We've been supporting the open communication um, of, of research in this way. We have a webinar series, the Bellstein Talks. And, um, but two of our open science projects where we invest most of our resources and definitely most of our energy are Diamond Open Access Journals and the related preprint server Bajan Archives. Hmm. And, um, yeah, happy to talk more about Diamond Open Access yes, or go down this path if that's yeah. interesting. Um, this is those very are much kind of our general portfolio. Well, that's that's a big portfolio to have as a foundation with, a, well, it, it might have that you have a discipline focus on chemistry. But also related subjects, is it? Like where there's an um, intersection to other disciplines like biochemistry or physical chemistry. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it brings fears, moments of fears also back to my memory. <laughs> like chemistry was not my favorite topic in school or at uni, but I, I fought my way through it. <laughs> But it's not for most people, and that's why we got to work on communication because uh, it is fun and it is interesting. It is like I had my it. I had my moments of oh my god, it's actually logical, and like once you get your brain around these tiny molecules, it actually has such cool other than things exploding in the lab, but um, which can be fun and exciting to watch. But then to actually understand what's happening is like when you get to that point. But it's like with math, it's just taken me so long to get to such a point, <laughs> like, and then repetitively so. But yeah, yeah, chemistry definitely needs better promotion. And I'm glad that the Bayesian Institute and you and the team are working on that mm -hmm. and continuously improving. But um, but I know, since you mentioned Diamond Open Access, that that's a matter of heart for both of us. Can we just have a quick definition of Diamond? Because that doesn't seem to be in everybody's... Um, uh awareness mm -hmm. is it that i mean let me just start and then you fill in so diamond open access can be or, or is a form of publishing um open access so accessible to the public where the public does not pay obviously i think that's the definition of open access in the first place but so neither the reader an internet user pays to read the whole article and associated materials like methodology or and or data, um, nor the author who's done the research and then compiled information into a research article, um, prepared the data sets and then submitted for publishing has to pay extra beyond what they've already invested in work time. So because we both know and, and probably most of our listeners are aware that there's costs implied, these costs can be ca carried or Put across several other shoulders other than those two stakeholders and who these shoulders or pots of money come from is like can either be funders like research funders um institutions the host institution where the research was done in the first place with a dedicated budget beyond the research budget um but then ex explicitly not paying for APCs to a certain it's already getting complicated it so is yeah, and I think as, as soon as you move to the so we all understand open access I think no one really has a there's, there's really no arguments what open access is the readers need to have free access internet, right so based on yeah you exactly you can download the, you can you can read the article and you don't right. have to to pay anything you don't have to log in or give your data mm -hmm. um 
this is free to read. I think the, okay, well, the, the issue comes with 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 um, who who is, is who pays for this? Because yeah, like you said, we're not we're we're in agreement that it it costs something. Mm -hmm. So then, um, who is paying for these costs? And that's, I guess, for me, I don't I don't like to 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 say this is the definition of diamond. I can only describe what we yeah. do, what, what our model is. Yeah, maybe the diamond easier. label because you need this label yeah. to to talk to people, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I always when 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 you know if we make a promotional flyer or we talk about it at a conference i always give more words i don't just say diamond open access because it can mean different things and i yeah. i also think that's okay uh we're, yeah, we're figuring this out we're navigating yeah. it, you know <laughs> also as long as we don't pay one entity just for the purpose of well i think it's usually a mixed pot of money and then or pre-dedicated money for yes we pay for publishing and we know who's getting paid for what kind of work and processing the publishing um, yes transparency okay. is a word that that comes up a lot when we're talking about these different ways to define the business models and i think that's that's essential to know um what is being paid to to publish this right. information and who is paying it and where does that money come from yeah. um is this taxpayer money is this um is, is it appropriate uh, the amount of fees that are being charged yeah, i mean if 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 a publisher is is so efficient that they can really um publish in an, in an efficient manner that's uh yeah um this is less of an issue if if then then uh, you know charging mm -hmm. twelve thousand euros for an article i don't um i think people have less problems with um you know some of the smaller open access publishers than they do with um, some of the big name publishers who are really, um, you know, charging a lot of money. Yeah, that's, that's a different topic getting off a of diamond, but. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it really gets easier if we look at diamond on a use, use case scenario. So mm -hmm. if an institution has their own journal, which they either sub subsidize through their own budget, can that be diamond then? Was it right, and I, yeah, and I, I think I, at least from my perspective, from someone who's been publishing or, or, or an institute that's been publishing Diamond Open Access for decades, I don't, I don't mind that other people use the definition in a slightly different way. Sure. Um, I, I think we, we're just we're we're mm -hmm. trying to figure out who are like-minded um, and who's um, who has the best interest of of mm. the the publisher or have the best interest of the the public. In, in mind and um and it, it's a term that we use so that we can come together and work together and know who we yeah. want to work with um but, what, but yeah the, but for us it's mm -hmm. yeah i'm sorry no just to clarify so what we want to um achieve through putting a label like diamond woman x is to make clear that we do not want the audience like the reader readers have to pay nor the submitting authors because we live in a globalized scholarly ecosystem mm -hmm. landscape and the researchers have unevenly distributed budgets available. So it wouldn't be fair to charge a certain amount to any who's submitting. It's already getting complicated, but now what's the Bystein open diamond open access way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, we also to absolutely agree uh, uh, with the sentiment that, that everyone should have, um, equal access to uh, read and publish, um, but but I think there's um, but but there's also the libraries. There's also the funders. There's also um, you know right now with we we also work to at least with the model that we're using. We also mm -hmm. want to eliminate the burden for um, also librarians. Um, they need mm -hmm. time to engage um, with 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 their researchers instead of engaging in contract negotiations. This is sure. a lot of time that they're spending in the last years with these contract negotiations um, and less time to library. Um, and I think this they, is a pity yeah. too. Um, they, yeah. They've turned into, or they, they now they have to have skills in um, legal skills. And um, this is not in their job description, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. And this is also what we're working to reduce this barrier for the librarians. Uh, so with the kind of model we have, they don't, there's nothing to negotiate. Mm -hmm. um, we take care of this. Um, and that's, that's kind of that's how we define for us diamond open access that um there are no fees there never were there never will be whatsoever and that's for readers 
um, for authors, for universities, for librarians, and for, for funders. Funders need, in my opinion, they, they focus on funding research. Mm. Um, yeah, researchers need to publish um, and communicate their research, but um, I think there are existing um, models that can mm. cover um, a lot of this publication process, and that's we're, we're one of them, or one of many of models that, that, that can do this. Yeah. Um, do you want to go into the production process of the two Diamond Open Access journals that you host? Um, sure. What do you mean? Um, As in, like, because you mentioned you also have an in-house preprint repository. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. what's the workflow from submission to publication? Mm -hmm. And how, yeah, with regards to, okay, what's the Diamond approach in the process? And what are the checkpoints? Basically? Yeah, I mean, we basically function like every other, let's say, journal or, or um, publisher. I mean, we're not a publisher, but we function, um, the mm -hmm. journals function as if they're going through a regular uh, process um, of any other um, journal. Um, the, the process itself is not any different. We did add a preprint server onto our journal platform. Um, and this came from um, the authors expressed a desire to have um, the ability to share their work earlier. Um, and because publishing quality publishing takes time mm -hmm. um, and um, this um, to meet this need, um, this was um, something that, that we agreed with our researchers that that was something beneficial for them. And um, about a third about, I think the last statistics, statistics were about a third or 25% of our authors who are eligible to publish a preprint do. Um, so they use this um, this this function, mm -hmm. um, but but otherwise that's that's really the only different um, step. Um, I mean, of course, at the end there's no payment uh, and there's no bill uh, that arrives at their uh, in their post box. But um, otherwise, our process is um, very similar to to other quality journals. It goes through mm -hmm. peer review process. Um, we have, of course, first internal checks. Um, we check for plagiarism and copyright issues and um, some basic checks. Um, the articles then go to our associate editors who are um, our board members and they are they handle the, the peer review and these are um, typically university professors or um, researchers that are actively working in the field. We feel like that's very important. The scholar led aspect, I think, is also very important to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, there's a time and place for professional editors in certain fields, but at least for for chemistry. Um, we stand behind um, the statement that we feel that these the peer review process needs to be handled by um, an editor who's actively doing research in this sub discipline um, mm -hmm. that they're editing. Yeah. Um, so the associate editors then handle the article. They make the decision to to publish or reject. Mm -hmm. And um, then we have um, our our uh, staff here internally, which work on the production of of the article, which is done at a exactly the same professional level as any other journal article. We work on um, dissemination as well. We have um, JATS, HTML, JATS, XML. We have all of the technical bells and whistles that all of the other publishers have. Um, and um, our website is also uh, meets and exceeds the standards of, of other um, publishers as well. So that's mm -hmm. our typical process. Cool, great. Mm -hmm. Um, not so different than than any other journal. Yeah, it sounds quite familiar, and it's also good, I think, for many who are listening, um, to to just see or hear the workflow from a mm -hmm. can I say publisher's perspective, even though it's like it's, the Russian Institute is clearly mm -hmm. more than a publisher. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, um, the processing mm -hmm. um, workflow. Yeah, I feel that it's, and I think another aspect that's also important that sometimes is, sometimes is overlooked. So our staff, they're also um, every one of our staff, everyone who touches the article also has um, previously done research in in uh, the broad area that they are working with. Um, mm -hmm. They've done PhDs, um, they've done postdocs, um, they have experience too, and I think that's that's also important. Um, the work is not outsourced. Um, not that outsourcing is always bad but um 
they are employees and they receive good benefits. Um, they're paid well, they have um, a good working environment. And I think that's also an aspect that, um, that, that we shouldn't, um, that, yeah, I think this aspect sometimes isn't um, emphasized enough that, that the yeah. people actually working, they they have to be paid. Everything is can't just be volunteer labor. Otherwise, the whole system collapses. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, also to show quality that you have people who are actually comfortable in their position and the tasks they're doing. Mm -hmm. So not to have to stress about money constraints or pressure mm -hmm. points by the employer to... To meet right. a certain I to don't meet know. some targets, yeah, yeah. This is that's the that's the benefit, and that's also why we think that this kind of model publishing with a nonprofit is also mm -hmm. important because we, um, you know, we don't have this pressure to publish. Um, we don't have to um, meet um, shareholder demands. Um, we don't have to meet some profit uh, goals. Mm -hmm. um, we are here to publish quality, and that's really our. Uh, KPI, uh, which yeah, I don't necessarily like this uh, <laughs> this acronym, but definitely not in context of our work. But um, yeah, our KPI That's, is to produce mm -hmm. quality research and to publish it, to publish yeah. quality research. And um, I think it's important yeah. to have such indicators um, for quality and performance in if it's in within lim limits that are humanly acceptable. And not only acceptable but comfortable. Yes. Uh, where where we don't turn ourselves into robots, as, as we mm -hmm. just got ahead of the recording. Yeah, and they don't provide negative incentives, um, yeah. such as you need to have so many publications per month um, so that um, we have enough profit. I think that's a bad incentive. Um, oh yeah, yeah. When... For the non-profit act of research, it just doesn't fit together mm -hmm. well, in my opinion. So I'm wondering how, like, what's what's the process and capacity at the moment for the two journals that you're hosting? Should I should I highlight again Diamond Open Access Journals just to to shine a light on on that aspect again? <laughs> and we want to see more of that. And thanks for setting the example. Um, but um, how how's the submission rate compared to your, the the editorial team's capacity to process? Because that sometimes is an in-house um, pressure point, which often leads to delays in processing times, which are unintended, but just happen to be because of the high, high throughput that mm -hmm. some publishers are dealing with. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good point to bring up, a good question to ask, especially when you when you have a small journal, a small team. Um, this is this can be important. You know, you can get a lot of submissions at once, and then the authors are disappointed that their article doesn't get processed quickly enough. Um, whereas, if you're a large journal, you can spread this out in a different way. Um, but how we handle it is that um, so I mentioned we have lots of different projects, we work in different areas, mm -hmm. and we try to make our projects uh, a bit flexible. So. Um, all, um, so the people who work on the journals are also working on other projects too, right? So we have a bit of a balance there. We can um, spend more time on the journals or more time on our other projects um, as the need uh, comes. Um, uh, but yeah, this is, this is an issue. Um, I think it's more of an issue for, for, for an organization that doesn't have a broad portfolio of other projects. But for us, this um, is, is not so much an issue um, but I, um, I would say that we, we, and not only us, but other diamond open access journals that I work with, um, we would all actually like to have more submissions. So a lot of, one question that comes often is what about scale, diamond open access, scale, scale, scale. I always hear this question or this, this, um, this issue. Um, and, um, at least all the diamond app open access journals that I'm associated with. I'm also on another uh, associated with another group, the free journal network where 80 to 90 diamond open access journals. And um, we all say the same thing. We would actually like to have more submissions. Um, we have more capacity and we would, I think at least most of them in this network would probably say easily, we could probably double our capacity. Um, but the issue is um, that, that um, unfortunately, researchers and librarians and funders, um, they're not um, taking advantage of uh, the existing diamond open access venues as well as they could. 
Um, this, of course, has some reasons. Um, you know, we talked at the beginning about incentives, research um, uh, assessment and uh, incentives there. Um, you know, our journals are high quality and we stand behind the quality of our journals um, and, um, you know, we, but we still have to contend with issues um, or questions from, from potential authors about the journal impact factor, for example, this question comes up often. Mm -hmm. um, and for some of them, this, we don't meet their expectations in this sense. Um, and this, this is, tends to be an issue um, for all of us in this diamond open access area, um, especially in um, the STEM areas, um, less so in math, um, but in other STEM areas, um, we all have this issue that we would like to publish more, but the authors are sometimes turned off by um, some of these metrics um, that are being used inappropriately to judge quality. Mm. Yeah, that's unfortunate. And it's also a, like I, as a trainer, I decided to ignore the topic altogether unless it's brought to me. And then I refer researchers back to, okay, look up what the impact factor actually does. And you can also, it's a fun fact, the original article written by Eugene Garfield, who mm -hmm. came up with the impact factor, is still behind a paywall at Science. It is like no. the Science main journal. And you would think after more than 50 years, it would be liberated as such. Yeah. But, but there's a free copy available, which I'm happy to share also to this podcast. And uh, so I, I refer people to that article where it's not explicitly said, but Eugene Garfield goes around saying, oh, it's actually not a good metrics, not, without using these exact words, but highlighting the flaws and asking readers to be cautious in applying the impact factor for ranking purposes explicitly because and then a few years later or just a decade ago um there was another article by him where he sort of says yes it has flaws but it's the best we have at the moment i think there was still an era where criticism had come up but it wasn't as obvious that it's so detrimental and so counterproductive for what you're trying to achieve as a scholarly community um so we're still defensive of it saying oh it's the best we have so deal with it but mm -hmm. i like i think like all the open science advocates that i know of yourself including and me and many others um we often engage with I just know that well, it's, it's not made for the purpose that it's being used for for and I think the other issue that researchers have, like I, I know that in, in biology, like people would pride themselves, oh, I landed a, a paper in, of course, nature, but also cell, this and that. So a certain, like there's all culture, cultural prestige kind of <laughs> culture around um, publishing in certain journals, which is tied to the impact factor, but also... There was also this article which I often give as a reading exercise to participants in my scholarly publishing courses. Um, um was issued in 2016 by the British newspaper, again, The Guardian, where okay. they focus on um, the rise of the Elsevier Empire mm -hmm. and basically recapping how, how that came to power. And yeah. And now there's been follow-up articles since then. Basically. I think that was a good one. I think that's, I read this one probably once a year. I go back to it and right? read it and you're like, and it just becomes more and more true every time you read it, the more you learn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I think that was a... Commercial publishers are killing societies eventually, like, or not killing, but it's like harming dreadfully. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, the issue, this big, the big buyout that uh, is happening, has been happening. Um they're buying the smaller journals and the society publishers are, are being bought up and yeah. sucked into the and top five. Um, yeah, this is... But a, also the image never... Like, I can't get rid of that image in my head where they describe how... What's his name? The founder of Elsevier. Um, well, I'll, I'll report back later. So it will be in the, in the comment section of the podcast, um, the show notes. So how he invited... Um, highly reputable researchers to a cruise on the Mediterranean and 
poured out alcohol and, and food and whatnot and made them sign contracts to tie themselves to only publish in his journals. And the onset was actually like a 20 something guy. I have another person in my head who had a similar career um, uh, ambition. Like, how can I get rich the quickest way possible? And looked at the scholarly publishing, you wouldn't call it industry at the time, but you know, the university publishers, like, oh, that's a bit boring. You can do better than that. There's no color imaging and whatnot you can do, fancy pants. And of course, that attracts people. <laughs> Of course, researchers would like to have their results showcased in all kinds of fancy manners to also for the purpose of science communication. So there's nothing wrong with that. So I think, yeah. So But that really got me like and never left me with the, oh my God, so much wrong in the system. Like, and the impact factor is like the hook for everything, seems like. But this is also how it evolved um, or how one thing led to the other and now we're stuck here. Um, yeah, that's interesting. But then once researchers and early career researchers get a glimpse of the happenings in the past and how, why things are the way they are today and what options they have, I think it's easy to shift the paradigm. Well, relatively speaking, of course, we might need to reach the masses, but how do we get yeah. there? Yeah, the issue is, yeah, so so when we, we also work on, ad, we, we advocate also for, um, you know, a better, more sustainable, fair system. And when we go and we talk to, to researchers, we talk to our editors, we are always gauging, you know, how they, how they react uh, to this topic. They, it's not that they don't know that it exists. They know that, um, they know what the journal impact is journal impact factor is how it's calculated they know about these rankings um but they um their response is always they're they're trapped in the system so it's a bit of a stockholm syndrome right they're they're trapped and they just want to get by um and they want to build their careers and that's what they have to do mm -hmm. so for them um i don't think they care so much what the system is they just need to get through get it through, right yeah. mm -hmm. um so for them i don't um at least i've i, I don't think they're the really the right target um uh, they just want to do their research and they're having to do all these things to do I know, research, yeah, yeah. right and that's what i try um, to accomplish as a trainer is exactly to empower them with alternatives because there are alternatives and then i think it's still an opportunity to raise certain points and how things evolved into the current status um to question it again and to not because I've seen too many people as well of my peers and when I graduated like through my um PhD um who just gave in to okay that's what it is well then let me see how I get through and make my career and sustain mm -hmm. my family no if there's so many of us who just give in to the status quo nothing will ever yeah. change and we've mm -hmm. seen so little change in the past two decades alone, but then also a lot of change on the yeah. Mm -hmm. So I feel like empowerment comes with knowing knowing your options. This is, is my kind of approach now. Know your options and question the status quo, not to your, on your risking your own career, but there's always more than one option that you have at your fingertips. Yes. And, yeah, and mm -hmm, I agree. And and to extend beyond, beyond science, beyond scholarly communication, um, but I think also related. I mean, you know, when when people are asked on their on their deathbed, what 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 regret do they have? Um, it's the first one is usually something to the extent of, um, I wish I'd been true to myself, and and mm -hmm. I wish I had not lived my life for others, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think this is. Hmm, being in the system and being trapped in the system, um, you're, you're living your life for others right. and not for the sake of what, um, you know, compels you and motivates you in life. And um, to huh. take stand, to take a stand here, um, I think this is a very critical time in, in, in a researcher's lifespan is to look at this moment when they start publishing um, and say, is this, is this, really um what what i want or am i doing this because um yeah because of others i want to please others i want to um yeah, yeah i think that's and it's yeah. and it's difficult to break away from the norm it is um it is but it shouldn't be so and also like it's i'm actually getting goosebumps because it's bringing us back to the beginning of the conversation where you shared like why you 
chose to shift games, like trying to serve academia instead of serving it, uh, or serving it differently than in terms of trying to change it to the better again. Because I, like in my trainings, like now we have the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation, we have the Open Science Principles, um, all of which postulate come with principles and values, as UNESCO now also postulated. Um, and then I now they start with um, ref, ref, referring to the Human Rights Declaration, Article 27, which yes. explicitly says that every human being on this planet has a right to engage in scientific achievements and have, also have their knowledge and their participation thereof protected. And this is what open science is calling for. At the end of the day, we're talking about good scientific practice and human values. And the system, as you said in the beginning, is not allowed to do that today. So, yeah, so basically the whole podcast, but especially <laughs> also this episode is about, okay, there are a few things we can tweak and twingle to, to allow the system to serve its purpose again. And each of us can play their part. And the Bachelor Institute certainly does a lot to on on their yeah on your capacity with your activities. Yeah, and in that sense, I should say that we're not our goal here is not to publish all of chemistry. That's not what we're here, but we're here to set an mm -hmm. example to show about how things could be, and to show that there is a model, there is a way, and it doesn't mean that all chemistry needs to be published this way. Mm -hmm. um, but there are options, and there are options mm -hmm. for people who do decide. You know this this other route is not for me um then that's what we're here for um sure. yeah that's so um for other chemistry scholars and researchers in particular out there like any researcher from any part of the world can submit their articles to any of the two journals mm -hmm. or yes so have yeah, no there's absolutely no restrictions whatsoever um, does it focus on no. organic chemistry and nanotechnology, and nanotechnology yeah mm -hmm. That's a, those are our current two focuses uh, focus um, because that's where our um, that's where our our, our in house um, um, expertise is. Um, so the like I said, I think that it's very important that those who work on the journal production mm -hmm. also have a background um, in in the area in which we're publishing, and that's where our current um, background is is around nanotechnology and organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but that could also change with time. But that's uh, those are. That's why we currently focus on these these areas. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to have exp well to offer venues where you actually have enough expertise. In. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, and then like for the in the broader chemistry community, there's um, preprint repositories like Chem Archive as well. There's um, scholarly society um, publishers like the American Chemical Association. American Chemical oh, Society, ACS. Society, and then the Royal Society of Chemistry, yeah, RSC. Um, and then a few others. So you're one of one of one strong of several other players in in the discipline of um, chemistry and and broader STEM, part of broader STEM. And I just wanted to highlight again. I I showed this also to you, like where. Um, we've collected open science resources, and it started off with the chemist or with the as well chemistry, but a discipline specific approach. Um, uh, we will link this also to the show notes or the uh, affiliated blog post it comes with the with the release of this episode, where we have a collection of chemistry related and chemistry focused open science resources. So all the chemistry people, you're welcome to tap into that resource and um, and approach the Vajan Institute's contact details. And maybe we can also, well, you, we usually also put your LinkedIn and um, the contact details that you chose to be contacted through um, in the in the show notes so that people who would want to know more can reach you or we can refer to you any inquiries that come in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Be happy to talk with anybody in the community has ideas about how we can, yeah, reach our mission or to reach their, their particular group or, um, yeah, to do a better job at um, helping researchers communicate. Yeah. 
Mm. Maybe as a last word, so what is on your roadmap for the this year, or the coming one or two years? What's what's next in the version? Is it, are you shifting gears to a new branch of activities or are you looking to? Uh, yeah, we're working. Yeah, I can maybe give you a little bit of an overview. So I gave in the beginning a little bit of an overview of our, our current projects, but mm -hmm. um one emphasis in the next years is going to be, so with the journals, we want to move the journals from not just open access, but to open science. So we'll be incorporating more um, open data and all the other open science principles into the journal um, more over the next years. Um, data is right now our focus. Um, it's a tough one, but we're working on it with um, together with the community on some different pilot projects. Um, so that'll be an emphasis, um, and we're going to be working more um, to support um, so basic infrastructure too, um, just generally, and um, we're also working on some um, educational projects as well, um, trying to help um, younger researchers um, fulfill some unmet needs that they may have um, right now, and uh, we also support general outreach as well. We support um, chemistry museums and um, outreach in this since as well. Um, I would like to do more in that aspect. Um, I'd love to cover the whole wheel of everything in open science, um, but we do what we can, especially within uh, or in terms of what's most important in chemistry um, and communication of chemistry, which tends to be journals and conferences. So that's really where our focus is, um, mm -hmm. but, but we're always looking for ways to support others um, all along uh, this open science wheel. So mm -hmm. yeah, but open data will be our next focus over the next uh, two years and machine readable um, chemical information. Mm. Cool. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to see machine readable chemical formulas popping up here and there. Yeah. <laughs> or hopefully you won't see them. That's the point. They should work in the Ooh. background. So hopefully you don't have to see them, but you'll have access to them. <laughs> okay. I was going to add more. We mentioned the word chemistry. I started to miss those, but fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you so yeah, much thank you so much yeah thank you too this was a, a great chat and um yeah always always happy to chat with you joe thanks Likewise. thanks for joining us to listen to this episode do let us know what you think you can email us or connect with us on our social media channels which you can find on our website at access to perspectives.org Email us at info at access to perspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management, and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time. <laughs>